there is nothing special about me. You know, I grew up in Trilly County Kerry with five other siblings. Maybe the only difference is that I couldn't walk away. She just wants the best for those kids, that's all, you know. I was so naive when I was 22. I look back at myself now and I was thinking, I was living in a dream, in a cloud. Louise, she's our friend. Louise, she's our daughter. Louise, she's a great support of the children in the orphanage called Amad. People have told me throughout my life that I will never make a difference. I won't make a difference, it's too big, I'm wasting my time. I cry all the tears in the world for them. Africa doesn't need my tears. It needs me to be, it needs my actions, it needs me to be a doer. It really is uh, the children that suffered abuse and neglect, like, for, for a child not to have a home or somewhere that they're safe. It's, I, I just couldn't imagine that because I've been so lucky myself. The work she's done, she has done, the work she's doing is just, it's mind blowing. They say, you know, uh, about teachers, those who can do and those who can't teach. I was one of those who can't, so I thought, Louise teaches as well, but boy, can she do. The way she goes about the work, there is absolutely no fuss. You come out here, you meet the kids, they have, they have very little, but they always, they're always smiling, and they are always so appreciative of what they get. They really, you just love them. Louise was brought in Africa, Tanzania like a small angel from heaven. Maybe she cannot know about this, but to me, it sounds that way. My name is Eva David, I'm 17 years old. We came here because our life are difficult. Our parents in the village, they can't care us, they can't give us education due to the problems facing them. I'm 19 years old, I'm in high school now. I came in Kalamani in 2009 when I nine years old in October. I am 17 years old. I came here 2007 uh, when I was five years old. I'm 18 years old. When my parents was dead, I think I was two or three years old. I couldn't go back to my life and say, and pretend this didn't exist. I saw it with my own two eyes. How can I walk away now? I can't walk away. And I felt like these children have been destroyed because of adults and the actions of adults. And hello, I'm 22, I'm an adult. I have a responsibility now as an adult to do something, that's what I felt. I said, this is your responsibility. You can go through your whole life and say, someone should do something about that. Someone should do something about that. And then, you know, one day I looked at myself and I was like, I am someone, I can do something. I, I am capable of doing something. And then I said, you know, you don't ever look to anyone else to do everything and to solve all the world's problems. I said, you know, you have to look inside of yourself and say, I can do it, I can do this.
I'm a primary school teacher in Calorglan in County Kerry. I teach first class, uh, six and seven year olds. And when I was a student in UCC, um, just finishing my final year, I was 22 years of age at the time and I decided I wanted to go to Africa to volunteer my time in, with an agency. The company required me to fundraise about 2,000 euro for a month's stay. So before I travelled to Tanzania, I ran numerous fundraisers over the months prior to my departure uh, to raise the money. And I raised well and above beyond and beyond the 2,000 euro. I'll never forget the first day that I walked in through the doors of that particular orphanage and the tears just started to flow because the conditions that those children were living in were just terrible. Uh, there were so many kids in there, just, I don't know, nearly 100 children. None of them were in school. They weren't being looked after properly. So I was really upset with myself because all the money that I had raised now had gone to the CEO of this company and nothing had gone into the project. And that's why the project looked the way it did because no money was being pumped into it. We are great friends, and again, I say she's like my younger sister. We met at uh, 2006 in a certain orphanage. The same time, she came to volunteer for three months. The same time, I was just volunteering there, because since beginning, I had burden to work with kids, but I didn't know how to go about it but my, head, my heart failed just to go and work with orphans because me also, I'm an orphan. I met a woman called Monica Tukai. She was actually um, volunteering in the school and Monica used to travel there every day and teach the children English. I just thought that was a very admirable thing to do. I said, here is this woman leaving her home every day. Her four small children were being minded by other members of the community. She was traveling this long distance in the heat every single day and she was working for nothing, she wasn't getting anything. And I just thought, wow, this lady, she's amazing. You know, I thought, re really, really admirable woman. One day I said, you know, why don't we set up our own? And I said, is it possible? Could we do this? I said, uh, I will run it from the Irish side and uh, you can run it from the African side and I'll go back to Ireland straight away and I'll start fundraising and all of that. And she just looked at me and she said, it's possible. Anything is possible. So we went on from there. Well, the first time I met Louise, in fact, I was so happy to see her. She was a beautiful girl, very happy. Uh, she became very familiar in a very short time. And that's how the journey began. So I had to make a really difficult decision at that time, okay? I had fallen very much in love with those kids in the orphanage. And I knew that if I was to change something, that ultimately I would have to leave them behind. I would have to cut that, that little bond that we had at that time. Um, that was very difficult for me because sometimes I still think about them, I wonder, you know, where they've ended up and things like that. But I knew that if I was to move forward and create my own project out here, that, you know, they couldn't be part of that. I would have to start from scratch because they were involved with some other organisation and that's just the reality of it, so. Like when I, when I first came over, I honestly thought there was a big operation here. I half thought Louise was having me on. You know, I thought she had kind of expanded the truth a little bit. But when I came over and it really dawned on me, this is actually down to Louise. This is, she has done this. Single-handedly, really. What had she taken on? Like, where was this going? What was it doing to her as a, as a person? It was taking over her life and she'd always be very positive and never let on that anything was negative or, you know, that it was, it was hard for her, but how could it not be? There's children over here that can't eat unless you can provide for them. A girl in her 20s. The facilities are very basic. 
it houses, I suppose, anywhere up to, you know, 40, 50, sometimes 60 people. The kids share dormitories, the boys have their dormitory, the girls have their dormitory. Uh, the cooking usually takes place on the outside. Um, it's, you know, very, very warm. It's very, very dusty. But there is a great contentment there as well. You know, the kids look out for each other and um, there seems to be um, a great spirit amongst them. I adore the children of Tanzania. That's why I keep on coming back because they're the ones that I work with. I always thought Louise would have lots of children of her own. She was always surrounded by children. She got them. She seemed to get... She knew what made them tick. She saw the funny side of them. She was never... Some people don't have it, she has it, because she just loved them. But there's nothing happening yet. Anyway, this seems to be her family now, so... The first time I met Louise, I was afraid, because it was my first time to see someone like her, a yeah, white person. He called him Zungu in Swahili name. So when I saw her, the first time I was scared, but the more I, I learned her and then to stay with her, I saw that she was so kindly with us. Uh, we were small huggers when we were crying, changes our diapers, yeah. She's very kindly. I didn't know that this was actually going to be in my future, this 56. I've got one of the biggest families on the planet now. Kimbia Sungura, Kimbia, Kimbia kwa nyumba yako. Sungura yumo ndani ya nyumba yake. Kwa heri simba, nyumba, niko hapa, habari ya subuhi nyumba. Sema habari ya subuhi. Habari ya subuhi. Habari ya subuhi Sungura. Big mama, big mama, mama mkubwa, yeah, so that's what the children call me since the day I arrived. Mama, a big mama. See, the big mamas in Africa are like the larger women, let's just say. So I said, like, why are you calling me big mama, you know? I'm not, I'm not a large woman. And they said, not because you are fat, but because you have a big heart. And I said, oh, OK, you can call me Big Mama now. So even now you can hear the older ones will say, Big Mama or Mama Mkubwa, Mama Mkubwa. So I, I do answer to that. <laughs> For the last 13 years, she has been working with, with us, I and Pastor and Kaula Amani, till an og of an age. She has achieved many things. I was so naive when I was 22. I look back at myself now and I was thinking, I was living in a dream, in a cloud. I never saw obstacles in my way. All I saw was my final vision, and that was to have an orphanage in Tanzania. That was my vision. That's all I wanted. So we're at the Tirunilug Orphanage in Kindergarten in Kilimanjaro. Uh, I first came here in 2006 where I met Monica and Pastor Tukai. That day, she followed me on my back. The time I enter to my gate, and then I say, Monica, stop, Monica, stop. And then I look behind, I saw her. And then she came in, I welcome her, because I didn't have that good life. So she entered, and sh she met Pasta for the first time. I went there to meet her husband, her children, and to see where she lived. And I must say that when I met Pastor Tukai, uh, it was an instant love. I just instantly liked him. He's so charismatic and uh, it's just I just loved everything about him and our bond really developed from there on in. 
I wanted the children to have structure to their day, okay? A lot of them were coming in suffering from trauma. They were crying at night, they were having nightmares, they had nothing to do during the day. If their minds weren't occupied, uh, all they were doing was thinking about whatever had sent them to us in the first place. I just felt that that was very um, detrimental to their mental health in the long run. I said the kindergarten would be the best thing. They would have structure. They would get up at seven, have their breakfast in school for eight, study until two, have to have their nap. There was a day, there was something to do every day. Clap your hands. Show me your teeth. Yeah, maybe. Where's your stomach? The benefits of getting them into education early on, number one is we do teach through English. They speak Kiswahili language, but in order to succeed in long term in education, you have to be fluent in English because you can't get through secondary school without having fluent English because all the textbooks are in English. Uh, also, if you want to get into a certain job when you're older, like tourism or finance or uh, medicine, you need English, you need fluent English. In Tanzania, the way that works at the government schools, the children are educated in Swahili, which is a Swahili country. And then in secondary school, they begin to be taught in English. Well, that's a very difficult transition, and it really, it really derails a number of children's education. I think you can look to the private sector and see what does the private sector do. So for instance, you have a middle class parent, a middle class Tanzanian, who can take their children, send them to the government school, or they can spend some of their money and put them in private schools. Well, they put them in private schools. What is the medium of instruction in private schools? It's always in English, because those parents realize that for them to be properly prepared for high school, they need to have a, a working command of the English language. So we decided because of all of our children were so small when they first came in that they needed a little playground that we wanted them to be able to go and play somewhere on their Susbrick. Um, so we decided to put in a, a little playground for them. Again, we had to fundraise at home in order to get this built. Uh, it was handmade by the metal workers. And yeah, it's still here anyway, 12 years later. It's basic, it's really basic. And even now, our, uh, it, it's in need of repair. We could replace that very easily. Okay, so this is our communal area where the kids kind of hang out at night time, washing of the clothes takes place here, and cooking takes place over there. A lot of stuff is done outside. So the first room we're at here is the boys' dorm, and we've got up to 30 children, 30 boys sleeping in bunk beds in, <laughs> in the boys' uh, room at the minute. Colini Sema Diambo. Sema Diambo. Diambo. We are almost uh, around 60. In boys, there are two groups. There are small ones, zero to five, and big ones from six to 18. So small ones, they, they have their special room for them, zero to five. From six years to 18, they sleep in boys' room. There's two rooms, um, four beds, that is double, double decker. And each bed, they sleep two to three. Yeah. The orphanage is small. Where we are right now, in fact, is very small. Uh, a third, the house is rental. We want just to build a bigger, a bigger house, an uh, orphanage, a bigger house, where they can be, we can be able to cater for them. And this room here is our girls' dorm, and we have over 25, 26 girls sleeping in this dorm. My life here is, not, is somehow is good and somehow, somehow is not good because you see how we live this. Our house is not well good for us to be here. 
the rooms are small, no enough bedrooms. If you're a teenager, 14, 15, if you're a girl especially, and you're going through hormonal changes, not nice to be sharing, there is no privacy. You don't have stuff here, you can't have, you don't have a wardrobe, you don't have anywhere to put your clothes. I'm Toto Yangu. Oh, I know it's coming out of the toilet. Oh, that's the smell, I'm sorry, no. Uh, the first one is the boys' toilet, second is the girls', and the last one is uh, the shower at the end, which is just a tap on the wall. We don't really have a proper shower. And there's staff toilets are there, so there's two staff toilets as well for the teachers. And also, when our kindergarten is in full swing, all of those children use these toilets as well, so that could be another you know, 30 kids on top of that. It's extremely basic, and yeah, it's a little bit depressing, to be honest with you. you know. Here's the kitchen where we do most of our cooking. Now we've had big problems with this kitchen. Okay, I've had this kitchen since I came in 2006. It had been used by many families. Uh, we had a big problem with smoke inhalation from our, not only our workers, but our staff. So the children were getting desperate chest infections constantly. Monica was constantly getting chest infections. Um, the place used to just fill the smoke here and it used to run out all over the kids and everything at night time. Um, so two friends of mine actually fundraised to buy a stove uh, so they could cook outside and so that we could get hot water from the stove as well to wash the little babies. Who's under my leg? <laughs> Colin thinks I'm a swing. <laughs> He's going to climb up inside me when you stop. Look, they start fighting if you're, if you're not touching one over the other. Look at this now. Baby. They want to be picked up. This is the final part. This is our communal dining area. We, could, we can have up to 70 people at a time eating inside here. As you can see, it's quite small. Um, we've got a TV room in here as well where the children get to watch TV, mostly in the evening times. Once the homework is done, uh, they get to go on in there for about an hour of TV after. Okay, so this is the room where it all began back in 2006 when I sat down with Monica and Pastor and we decided that we were going to form together a little team, one Irish girl and two Africans, she's Kenyan, one Kenyan, one Tanzanian, and we were going to make uh, Tiran and Okaula Mani a reality. So we could uh, take in more kids and educate them, look after them, and most importantly, love them, which I think we do. Thank you, Mama. <laughs> You see them all crowded into a space that's small. There were nights here where it rained and they were in bed. You had to drag them out of the beds, they were drenched. The, the roof comes down, has come down several times and we're paying rent for the building and um, the owner, he just doesn't want to do anything. So it's back on us again to, to just, you know, repair everything again. I think it's pretty obvious that the, the building is just not up to standard for those children. They've, there's too many children, they've outgrown it. They need places to, you know, to study, to continue with their education. They just, they have one toilet, one shower between 55 of them. There's issues with roofs falling in, you know, the, the dorms, there's three or four of them to a bed. It's, it's just not good enough now, they're educated, they know what goes on in the world. They've seen movies, they've seen how other people live and why should they not get to have that? The time has come to build a new uh, orphanage centre for our children. Uh, we bought the land 10 years ago, but we began farming on our land. This was the first purpose of the land was to farm because we wanted to grow our own, again, sustainability. We wanted to use the farm in order to feed the children in the orphanage. To have a farm, it has pro to produce some things from the farm uh, to enable to run the orphanage. Uh, that's why we grow maize, sunflower, beans, and other things to help the orphanage, to support it, to help the orphanage. We're at the early stages um, this is the site that the new orphanage will be built on and our vision for this new orphanage centre is to have a home for the children, maybe catering for 50 children. We do have an NGO involved who is going to take over the entire management. So they come in, they do feasibility studies on your sites, they subsidise a lot of the costs for us and 
Um, they offer on the ground construction managers to oversee the entire project and then any funding can flow through the NGO. They are completing a feasibility study on our site. I'm very confident that the new orphanage centre will be built. Uh, it's just going to take the right people to come on board and to help us out. We're just missing the funding. It will mean that what I set, set out to do 13 years ago will finally become a reality. Tanzania, uh, um, the population of this country is about uh, over 50, uh, over 50 million people in Tanzania, and uh, many of them, in fact, they live in a rural area, rural area, and the uh, country, the country is poor country, it's a poor country. Here in Tanzania, we have many orphans. Number one, many parents they have lost their life through sickness, like HIV. Many people are dying with HIV, and at the same time, many people are dying with hunger, no food. So they end up dying. So that's how we find orphans. And at the same time, number three, is that uh, early child pregnancy cause many orphans. Because you see, a child is born, no father. Father is unknown. Later on, the mother is unable to cater for the children. My mom passed away in 2006. And I, I just, she's passing away when, during the birth of my young. We stayed with, with, with our father, together with my brothers. But the life is very hard, very, very hard. No food. Yeah, my dad is already passed. I still have my own mom. Yeah. I think I was maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure, maybe four years or three, because I was too young. I didn't even know. When I was this, when I was older, my mom told me that my father passed it that years. And I didn't even know her face, <laughs> his face. I mean, I just had a look on a picture and I know that this was my dad. Yeah. No two stories are the same. Everybody automatically assumes that, oh, they're all there because of AIDS. They're all there because of AIDS. They're not here because of AIDS. Um, they're here because of poverty. They're coming from the streets. They're coming from abusive homes. They're coming from severe neglect. You couldn't even imagine what they've been through. We have so many girls that get raped, so, so many. We do have children that have HIV and their parents have died from HIV. We have children that they're left with grandparents, it's like the middle generation has simply been wiped out with disease and everything else and the grandparents are left looking after them and the grandparents are elderly, they can't afford them. And then the children become a burden on them, they don't want them either. You know, my children often say to me that, like nobody want, wanted us, nobody wanted us. Yeah, most of them sometimes, the orphanage, uh, taking children from risk, like rape, or abuse, beating of the children, or sometimes children labor. So if we take those children to the orphanage, it helps them to get out of the risk environment. The people who decide which children come to live in Tirunanog would be the social services or even the police. Now we've had children dropped at all times of the day or night, babies, toddlers, older children, it doesn't matter, we can get any age group at any time. And sometimes they'll say to me or they'll say to Monica or Pastor, you know, we'll be back to collect them, we'll be back to collect them in two weeks. And they never come back, they never come back. Uh, the children the children come from in different places, uh, from different places, because uh, uh, our orphanage is, uh, for the moment, in fact, uh, 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 this area is just on one orphanage, which is uh, the rest of the orphanage were closing down. And uh, we are licensed to, to, to run that, to run uh, uh, the, orphanage, to the orphanage. So the old children, in fact, they are just found in, around the district here, they be found. Other people, other places, in fact, the ones who found like they have a serious cases from outside, of, uh, out of Kilimanjaro. Also, they be transferred to high district in Kalamani, uh, Tirana. Uh -huh. That's how we found like we have children from different places. So we're heading up to West Kilimanjaro. This is the area where a lot of our children came from. 
You know, my parents worry about me all the time coming to Tanzania, but I've told them the reality of the matter is I'll probably be more than likely killed in a car crash before anything else gets me. Because <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a little bit crazy over here. People are living in extreme poverty up there. You'll see yourself when you, what types of houses that the children would have grown up in. Um, over time, they just became a huge burden on their families and they just weren't able to afford to feed them anymore. So when the Tiernan Oak Orphanage was set up, you know, we offered a facility for these children to be able to come to us to be looked after and offer them an education, something that they would never have gotten if they were left in West Kilimanjaro. We go there with Louise and their friends there to meet our families, to know that and help them because they are very poor. Somehow I feel happy and sadly at times because I feel happy to see my father that is still alive and sadly because of his condition at home, he is poor. So, and he conducts some several walks uh, for LN income. So, the condition of, of at home, I think there are three rooms, uh, the house of timber, yeah. When our school is on break, the children go home and become part of that family. So there's a number of things that can be done, but making sure that children aren't isolated away from their community and their country is very important. And so it's something that has to be thought through and, and accommodated. When I go back to the children's villages um, with them, We've had families completely break down, completely break down. They cannot believe that this is their little, little nephew or niece or grandson or son, that they can speak even in a different language. They're blown away by that. We had a grandmother a few years ago and she just held my hands and she was like, do you understand? I cannot believe my little grandson can talk fluently to you and she couldn't stop crying. She was like, we never, you know, that's all they want for their children as well. They want them to succeed. They just don't have the ability to give that to them. I came from the interior of Sanya, at the village there where my grandmother is living there and my few relatives. Pastor and Monica, they allow us to go to visit them for just maybe one week, then we came back here. They are feeling grateful because I'm changed. You know, when I came here, I was a little. So now I have grown up, I'm a big girl. They are feeling proud. Sometimes they say, Go to tell, I mean, Pastor and Monica, thanks for what they have done to you. They feeling like speaking in English is very amazing because they don't know how to speak. So they are just grateful with how I am, yeah. I think what they have is something so special. They're together, they're a community, but you want them to be educated and you want them not, not to ever worry for food and to reach their ambition. and basically to be able to get employment and to be able to support themselves and to go on to have families and just have an opportunity that they don't feel because of their start that that's how they're going to end up. You know, Tiernan and Nag and Rafiki Foundation, we have kind of a unique opportunity to take some of the poorest children and actually develop them into future leaders because we can give them excellent education. The possibilities for their future dramatically increase. If they get education, and uh, education, which is compared with the skills, uh, it can help. It can help much. The generation, which is the generation which is which is coming up, they can come out with a, with a, a knowing that uh, uh, they can be skilled and uh, having uh, a knowledge of uh, change, transforming their life through hard working and also applying the knowledge that they have. It will help. You can see that with all the kids, the girls in particular. You know, they're always looking in a book or writing and. Um, this is that key that could um, just open different doors for them. 
I will be an engineer of construction because I like to construct maybe my percentage, some of my percentage to construct schools at villages. So my heart feels that to construct their schools, construct roads, because, I, because there's no development without construction, infrastructure like roads, transport, so to bring communication. My mom is living a difficult time, so what I had in myself is to improve and study hard so as my future to be good and I can have maybe better, you know, housing, life. Also, if I'm able, I'll help them, yeah. My dream is I want to be a, a lawyer. I want to help everybody equally without any corruption, without any, any, any stubborn, because some People are rich, others are poor. So that poor are discriminated to, to be like they don't have any value. So me, I, in my side, I want to help those who are, who others people, they, they can see them, they don't have any value, they, so that their rights could be equal. I've had different issues starting out as well and in the schools my children would have been treated differently because of the fact that they were viewed as being, you know, dirty, orphaned children that were worthless and not, not worth anything and they would have had a lot of hassle from teachers and, and principals of the schools who um, would have treated them really badly. Sometimes they're not being left into the class, they're being put, put out cleaning the, the yard, cleaning the the playground and I said but, you know I went down to the school the next day I was absolutely enraged I could have killed somebody I said I cannot believe that this is happening and that someone who is in this position could treat those little kids like that and the best thing to do maybe is to build our own school just build our own school um, so that was the reason behind building the school and I wanted to create as well a school with a nice environment and where the children felt safe and that they weren't going to be treated like that The one thing Monica and Pastor have told me my whole life, uh, when they can see me coming back over and over again and the amount of time and effort that I've put into this, they've constantly told me, have your own life, have your own happiness as well, please have. And they used to beg me when I was younger, have your own happiness. And they were saying, if someone comes into your life, you know, please, <laughs> please accept them in, you know. They were, <laughs> maybe they were trying to get rid of me, I don't know. Derek was given the ultimate test by me, okay? I would never bring a man out to meet my children, not in a million years, unless I could see something inside of them that maybe I, they were worth sticking around. So, you know, we were together, I don't know, close to a year. I said anyway one day, I was like, yeah, you know, I really like this guy. I'll bring him out with me. He was a teacher as well, and you know, I said he's bound to be good with kids. I mean, this is his profession. I did say it to him when he was going to Africa the first time, that if it didn't gel with those children, the relationship was doomed, because I knew that she wouldn't give up Africa for Derek or anybody else either. So I did say that. <laughs> I'd say within a year, I went out myself, she brought me out for the first time, and it just, it blew my mind. It really did. Uh, you know, they just, they fill my heart, you know, when I see them. You kind of uh, puts things in perspective, like any of the troubles that I'd have in my life at home or with school with the kids, you know, I just look at them and they're all so happy. They appreciate so much. We walked in the door and, you know, I was trying to introduce him to all the children and instantly, you know, they were just so attracted to his personality and he just fitted in really well. 
and he cried his eyes out when he was leaving and Pastor looked at me that night when, when Derek broke down in front of all of them. His leg was shaking and he, he was just a little bit of a mess and Pastor just looked at me and he winked and he said, you've got a good one there. And I said, yeah, I know. From the Irish side, the structure of the organisation would be that I am the director of the organisation and on the African side, me and Monica and Pastor, we work as a team. This is our partnership. We decide the next step. What's the best thing to do here? What's the best thing to do there? Maureen would be very much the secretary. She's in charge of our accounts. She's in charge of our charitable status and making sure everything is done legally in Ireland. We have a budget every month. We give them a budget of €2,000. OK, to, for food, etc. There are no administration costs, there are no flights paid, there is absolutely every last penny, and I can put hand on heart and say every last penny goes to the kids of Tiernan Oak. 2,000 isn't enough, but we're getting by on it. Uh, realistically, for the amount of children we have now, we would, be, we would really need to have about 4,000 a month coming out. But that ain't going to happen anytime soon. Monica and Pastor are here trying to do this project, trying to, they're here every day, trying to pay budgets. You never know what's going to happen here. The bus is going to break down, someone might need medical attention, and then they're trying also to not put pressure on Louise because they don't want to stress her out. They don't want to be a burden, but they also have the responsibility of these children. Yeah, Louise has an autoimmune disease and... She won't admit this, but, you know, the, the, the stress she comes under from the Tiernan Oak orphanage, it definitely has an impact on her health. I remember she took a year out when the school was being built and she was back within five months. When she came from off the plane from Africa, she was skin and bone. I really thought we got her into hospital as fast as she could. She was, she was really very, very ill. And, she, and then she was in steroids and she was huge and she was puffed and she was zonked most of the time. She went through a terrible phase. I thought that might, that she might see the light there and say, look, this is, my health is more important. She got out of it and she's still on medication, but she's still wants those children. She just adores them and they're all her life and that's, she just loves them. She's one of these people that never complains, but if you knew Louise and her energy and how bubbly she is and how much she enjoys life. And then when she's sick, that's just taken away from her. I can't imagine not having your health and then also having this responsibility on top of it. So I just, I just think it's really hard for her and I just hope that she does find some way of managing it, um, both her health and turning Oak. Stress brings on her condition, but she won't listen because she's stubborn. And I think that it does affect her. She says it doesn't, but it does, of course it does. She worries about those children. She worries if they're ill. She doesn't, the medical care isn't as good over there. So I, I, worry, about, I worry about her, I, I prefer if she, was here in Ireland and just continued on a normal life here. But it's not going to happen. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it had a huge impact. I felt my own illness on the organisation and the running of the organisation. Pastor would always say that if, if uh, I'm not healthy and I'm not well, then everything goes backwards for them. Um, because I wasn't, I wasn't able to fundraise, I wasn't able to put 100% of my energy into this, and it does require 100% of my energy. Uh, there were days I just couldn't even get out of bed. It wasn't possible. I couldn't even walk up the stairs. My body failed me. It just didn't work anymore, and there was nothing I could do about it. 
It's actually a hereditary illness, um, one that's in my family. Um, it's an autoimmune disease, so it means that even if I can appear to be healthy and I can look healthy, um, you know, I work with children obviously, and I can catch everything else even that they have outside of the illness itself. So during those years, 2014 to up to 2018, uh, there were months went by that I couldn't even remember having a full week of not being ill. Um, just in a severe amount of pain all of the time. And, um, you know, I, s oh, I don't want to talk about that actually. I'm going to leave off that. Oh, no, it's bad. I can go there. Mm. Okay, so my one regret that I have ever done to Pastor, you have to understand I was in desperation myself. Oh, I can't. Oh. I sent him a text message basically one night. And I just told him, like, I can't go on anymore myself because I was just in so much pain all the time. And, you know, he says it to me, he pulls me on my own. I think he got such a fright that day, you know, he really did. I think I really scared him because he kept ringing me, you know, to make sure I was okay because, like, mentally I wasn't okay because the amount of medication, everything was just, it was just totally messing me up in my head. And, yeah, I did send him a text message just saying, you know, I don't think that I can, I can go on myself. I'm not able. And uh, like, it really frightened him. Because sometimes when we're alone, you know, he pulls me to the side and he says, I'll never forget that day I got that message. He said, that was one of the worst days of my life. And he just said like, if you cease to exist, then we all cease to exist. So like, I felt really bad about that. But then like pastor has to understand as well that that wasn't me talking, you know, I, I'm not a person who gets depressed or anything. It was just from the amount of medication that I was taking. You know, I just wasn't in my, 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 I wasn't right in my own head. But yeah, it was, sometimes when I think about that, I just get so upset because I just cannot believe that I did that to him that night. And it's obviously impacted him because he's cried to me about that. You know, he said it was a very difficult thing to, to read, number one, and to try and to come to terms with. What I said, that was crazy talk, you know? I would never do that anyway, because all I have to do is just keep thinking of them and they're the ones that motivate me all the time just to keep going. <sighs> we have the same people that support Tiernan and Oak all of the time and they're just average working day, everyday people. Uh, without them, we would not exist. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, the recession impacted hugely on us. Um, we made very little money from any fundraisers that we had. There were months there I could not send money to Monica and Pastor. And, you know, I used to send a lot of my own money, like when I got paid my own wages and things like that, because I couldn't stand the thought, you know, obviously they're, they're my family, I'm not gonna let them starve. The only way we could kind of get through everything was back in 2007, I decided to start up a child sponsorship program. And that was the only constant we had every month coming into the account. But again, it, di it didn't reach uh, the, the amount we needed to pay our bills. It just didn't reach that. Monica and Pastor are initially, they are the primary caregivers of the children. Pastor is the dad. You will hear the children calling him daddy. And Monica, she's the mom, mommy. That's, that's their roles. Yeah, we ourselves, we live uh, as our family. And uh, they're very happy with us because all the time we found, uh, we, found uh, we are together, playing together, eating together, uh, worshiping together. 
and uh, all the time you phone like that. And uh, and uh, whatever they have a, a personal problem, they just come right here. Uh, I just ask you, Baba, uh, I'm in need of this. Daddy, I'm just feeling like this. So you can't distinguish our our own children and the, uh, and the, uh, the orphans. I was always remember my parents, but now I feel okay because Pastor and Mom took and be like parents to me. So I forget them. I forget my parents. I love my I love Pastor and Mom like my father, my dad. Now here we live like a family, not like an orphanage, uh, because we are we are growing up together. Share everything, plates, what, beds. So here, it's not like an orphan, we live like a family. Uh, small ones, big ones, they help small ones. Yeah, they advise them, they teach them. Yeah, that is how it is. of my future so if I fail means my future also will be filled so I have to I have to be strong to study hard yeah I have to be well so as my future to be well too if all these are end and I had a good life ah I really feel joyful first I should thank my God also I should come here in Kaolamani. If mom and pastor will be alive, I will thank them too. Yeah. <laughs> in Tanzania, there's no job without education, first of all. And for my future plans, education is more. I have to invest in education first. And then when I, I continue, because when you invest in education, the more you, you grow in mind, ability. You know, in this world, the Young girls, all of these, ja, just see themselves like they cannot do anything. They don't have voice to talk. But me, I encourage them today to be strong and share different ideas. Even some people, they can neglect their ideas. So like a young girl, you cannot do anything. But you just let ladies to be strong and to first of all, to value yourself. A few months ago, I was in hospital and I was, I was in in dangerous situation. So my dad told me, Miriam, we can do it. Don't, so don't give up. Pull up your socks and pray, and pray to God. He will, done, he will do things to you. So when I was in bed, I was trying to pray to God and remember that word, you could do it, you could do it. And he gave me a verse on Bible said that I will not die, I'll be alive. So. I'll stay with that word until now. I have only one year at secondary school. So when I finished my Form 4 examination, I was planning to tell my dad that I want to go to university to learn more about music. You are here, moving in no mist. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, walking in this place. I worship you, I worship you. People always ask me if I regret this because it has taken over my entire life. Um, it has totally consumed me. It's consumed me as a person. It's consumed my relationships. It's consumed every inch of me. And one of my older children, 
said something to me two years ago that just cemented the fact that I made the right decision 13 years ago. And she called me, I was due to go back to Ireland and she called me into the, her dorm room and she just said, oh, I just want to speak to you for a minute before you go. And I said, okay. And I went in with her and she said, um, she said, you know, I just want to thank you for everything that you've done for us. And I said, oh yeah, okay. You know, I was getting a little bit awkward. I didn't want to have, you know, I don't want them to be thanking me either all the time or whatever. And I just said, oh yeah, 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 you're, you're welcome, you know, that's fine. She said, no, no, no. She said, I, I just want to let you know uh, how special you are to us. And I said, yeah, okay. And uh, she just turned to me and she said, you know, when we're in bed at night and we think that nobody loves us, she said, all we have to do is close our eyes and think of you. And she said, you know, we know we're very much loved. And when I heard those words, it's the most powerful thing anyone has ever said to me. And at that point, I, as I was going home, I cried all the way home on the plane. And I just said, you know, that's the reason I did this. Because I wanted them to know that somebody in the world actually did love them and did care about them. So she's grown up with me. And to hear those words, I was like, I've completed my mission. You know, she does feel loved. That's good. That's all I ever wanted. Jesus.